Captain Nesbitt, Commander of Training Wing 5. Captain Potter, Training Wing 6. Vince Wibbs, Mayor Emeritus Pensacola. Colonel Linscombe, uh, SEAL of HT-8. Colonel Coleman, Command Officer HT-18. Captain Crapsaddle, SEAL of Annette uh, uh, Pensa. And uh, Captain Yeager is also here from Coronado. We're very happy to have you folks here this evening. And if I miss someone in the audience, and it's always uh, the threat of having have that happen to you, I do apologize. This evening's program is co-sponsored by the uh, Naval Museum Foundation and by the Association of Naval Aviation. And we're pleased that you've joined us for a fascinating trip back in time to an event that occurred 25 years ago. It's an incredible event about which books are written and that movies are made. Uh, it's a saga of Clementine II, and we're honored to have the courageous men that were involved in that historic event here this evening. And they're going to share their thoughts and their reflections with you. Our moderator for this evening's program at this point in time was a young lieutenant assigned to the F-33, young fighter pilot. At that point, uh, he may not have had the name, but eventually he came to, to be called Bad Fred. And we know not why. Uh, but today, <laughs> but today uh, he is known as the director of the Naval Doctrine. Will you join me in a welcome for Rear Admiral Fred Lewis? Clyde, Linda, his wife, 
children, Daryl and Vanell are here. And a uh, round of applause. First of all, I'd like the folks from HC7 to stand up, and I'd like you all to give them a round of applause. Some of them came a long way to be here for this celebration. at the time, Clyde Skipper, and is also here tonight, I believe, and that's uh, Commander Lloyd Parthy, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Parthy. And the uh, Detachment Maintenance Petty Officer, who was a second class at the time, is the Senior Chief Petty Officer Tom Hitchcock. special greeting that I want to uh, read now for the audience and for the uh, panelists here, and it comes from our Acting Secretary of the Navy. Greetings to the heroes of Clementine II and to the assembled gathering of eagles. On behalf of the Department of the Navy, I am pleased to recognize the crew of Sea Sprite Clementine II on the 25th anniversary of their daring night helicopter rescue inside hostile enemy territory. The uncommon valor displayed by Commander Lassen and his crew in the early morning hours of June 19, 1968, is an inspiration to all. The recovery of the downed aviators of Root Beer 210 from certain capture while under heavy enemy fire and the most hazardous of conditions was above and beyond the call of duty and will remain legendary in the annals of naval aviation. This act of bold men going in harm's way rescue their fellow aviators represents the highest devotion to service shipmates in the country. I would also like to thank the Naval Aviation Museum Foundation and the Association of Naval Aviation Gossock Squadron for recognizing these crews and arranging for this silver anniversary reunion. Best wishes as you commemorate this historic event. Sincerely, Frank B. Kelso, acting. Now we're going to get into, into a panel discussion, and I, and I want to take you back in time. I want to take you back to 1968. It was quite a year. In February of 1968, General Westmoreland deployed 45,000 men to Quezon in anticipation of a massive attack. And that same month, the Tet Offensive was, was underway. In 1968, Russia invaded Czechoslovakia. And the Johnson administration lamented that they had a $4.1 billion trade surplus down from a peak of $7 billion in 1964. Mark Spitz is recognized in 1968 as the world's number one swimmer at the age of 18. The 100 meter 10 second barrier is broken by three men for the first time at the Sacramento Relays. And Arthur Ashe, became the first black to win a U.S. singles crown. NBC's Laugh-In, the Mod Squad, the Smothers Brothers, and Mission Impossible highlighted the TV fair of the day. The Bee Gees made their American debut. Arlo Guthrie released Allison's Restaurant, and the Beatles recorded Hey Jude. Americans flocked us to the theater to see Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey, The Graduate, and The Beatles, and their cartoon The Yellow Submarine. Pictures such as In the Heat of the Night and Bonnie and Clyde competed for the Academy Award. 
Sadly, Bobby Kennedy was assassinated in 1968. And Jackie Kennedy married Aristotle Onassis. And the great comedian Charlie Chaplin died. In April 1968, the USS America deployed for the first time from Norfolk, bound for the Western Pacific with CAG-7 Bark, and with VF-33 assigned as one of the two F-4 squadrons. Our CO on VF-33 in June 1968 was Dave Shepard. The XO was Tex Elliott. Zeke Burns had the maintenance department. John Holtzclaw was safety. Loke Lynch in the audience was our ops officer. Black Logan was the schedules officer and my roommate. Roy Cash at Aircraft Division. I mention these names because these are great Americans here tonight. We'd been operating from the Gulf for several weeks, weeks conducting missions south of the 19th parallel in compliance with yet another of the administration's attempt to throttle pressure on the North Vietnamese. We had had several MiG encounters, all of which up to that point had been unsuccessful and which ultimately paved the way for the Alt Report and the establishment of Top Gun. So, in our view, when it began on the 18th and 19th of June, those days in 1968 weren't particularly special at the start, but the events which unfolded led to the accomplishment of one of the most heroic feats of that time. Acts of individual bravery were commonplace, but the incident we are about to describe captures the essence of personal and collective heroism. I want to turn to the panelists now and step through the, the incident uh, of that time. And to, to uh, set the stage, let me ask uh, Captain Burns, Zeke, to talk to us about, there you, Zeke, there you are, talk to us about the mission. What, what you were about that night, what you were, what the target was, and the other aircraft that might have been in your flight. Admiral Lewis, it's a real treat to see you here and to, to see you with uh, so much sail. You've come a long way since uh, those days 25 years ago, and I congratulate you, sir. And. Uh, Wish you well. To answer the question, we were on a night bouncer mission with an A6. We had a section of F4s, two F4s from the F33. And our mission was to make a circuit over the beach, quite a good ways north, close to 120 miles north of the DMZ. Go inland uh, nearly to the border, come south, and back out again. The A6's job was to locate movers, trucks, or whatever, carrying supplies to the front, which was then pretty warm down south. And I'm sure that people today, as we did then, wonder at the wisdom of sending six men in three marvelous airplanes after a couple of trucks. But I also think if you might change that equation a little bit and wonder what it must have looked like to our Marines and our fighting men on the ground down south when they got to see those supplies at the wrong end of the muzzle. So we were there to get those supplies before they were brought to bear on our brothers. We had made one circuit of our uh, track and found nothing. The A6 had had no luck. We were in trail of him. He flew about four miles ahead of us. We were a much faster airplane, uh, no offense to the A6 community. And uh, we zigzagged uh, behind the A6, waited for him to either sight somebody on his radar, uh, illuminate with flares, or strike with CBUs. Uh, the only thing we saw on the first circuit was a very excellent SAM sight. Uh, this fellow, of 
acquired us very quickly, locked us up, and I said to John at the time, I hope that guy doesn't shoot because he's pretty hot stuff. <clears throat> he shot the next time around. Ten guns. Let me leave it right there. Take it from there, uh, Zeke, if I may. Thank you very much. And Clark and Captain Hosbos, excuse me, sir. Um, John, can you talk about the circumstances of, uh, of the hit and, and the injection sequence? Start over. I, I wanted to uh, amplify Captain Burns' sentiments, and I would also say that uh, I'm really just 25 today because my life actually restarted 19 June 1968. Uh, we were brought in. The gentleman to my right here, 100% uh, respect, responsible for that. It's really a pleasure to be here. It's a big honor to all four of them. It means a lot to us, and it's, I think it's long, long overdue. And it's a real pleasure to be here as part of it. The particular uh, evening, uh, Captain Burns said we were flying behind an A6 and uh, we made our second track around a, a, a tour looking for trucks and uh, we were illuminated by the radars. Uh, we had instrumentation in the airplane that actually told us that uh, we were the airplane being specifically illuminated. Following that, we were the airplane being specifically locked onto by the enemy radars. Shortly after that, we were the airplane and the missiles were specifically guiding. We watched uh, two missiles come up off the ground, uh, some uh, probably 10 miles ahead of us. To give you some appreciation of the size of the missiles, uh, 38 feet long, which I suppose is about the size of one of the stanchions that are holding up the second deck. They're 19 inches in diameter, so they're at least twice as large, large, large bullets. They attain a speed of Mach 4, or four times the speed of sound. They programmed over and, of course, came directly for us. We were, I guess, about 6,000 feet at that point. The turn away from them uh, when you see them launch is, is uh, fruitless because all they're going to do is guide on you, so you have to wait until they're very close to you and they can't turn as tight as you can, and then you break away and hope that uh, your turning radius is tighter than theirs and uh, they're going to harmlessly by you. We were successful in doing that with the first two of them. About the time we uh, finished the second break, which happened to be down into the mountains in the pitch black night, Zeke screaming, pull up, pull up, to never fly us to the ground, because uh, we couldn't see the ground. They didn't have a nice light down there for us to uh, watch how close we were. And we're going on instruments, uh, they launched the third one. And, uh, now we're in a phantom that's essentially out of altitude, out of energy, and out of ideas they're a full afterburner having dumped all the bombs already because they're trying to get the airplane lighter so it would perform better. Uh, we watched that missile until it grew and uh, at the last minute tried to get it out of the front office and turned away from our nose and it hit someplace uh, underneath the, uh, I think, the right wing. With a jolt, uh, I guess you could probably uh, equate to something like this building falling on you. About as hard as anything you'd ever want to have uh, be a part of it so hard that it actually felt like your teeth were going to leave their mountains. The next thing I remember was opening my eyes and saying, that's interesting, I'm still alive, and uh, realizing that uh, the phosphorus ball of fire, and uh, I yelled at Zeke, get out, get out, and realized the intercom was, uh, was dead, and so I initiated an injection, and uh, simultaneously, uh, he had done the same thing trying to tell me to get out, thinking that the missile had hit the front of the airplane. And as he was reaching to change the ejection mechanism, where he could eject me first and then go himself secondly, he left the airplane. And as I came out, I guess the airplane was essentially straight down. If I went out below him, and uh, into the pitch black night about 10 minutes after midnight, tonight, 25 years ago, uh, we started this little ordeal. And, uh, I guess the first thought at that point is, uh, what do I do now? Because I'm uh, way up in North Vietnam. I'm in a parachute. There aren't any friendlies down there waiting to greet me. Uh, this is going to be really
real hairy. And, uh, so we went on down, and, uh, and probably two minutes in her parachute, hit the ground, with absolutely no warning that we were going to hit the ground, because the ground was dark. There were no lights, street lights, no horizon, a dark, overcast, cloudy night. And uh, when you hit, you just hit. When you return, you hit there. And uh, we fortunately landed in a very slimy, manure-filled rice paddy. We got our breath and we uh, finally run the and got together. Thanks, Claude. <clears throat> um, let me turn now to what was happening at that very moment uh, aboard the USS Preble. It was on, uh, on the SAR station in the Gulf of Tonkin. And, and Clyde, can you comment on the alert posture and what you guys were doing at the time and the time that they were shot down and just prior to you getting the alert board and launch? Is this all the truth now? I was asleep. <laughs> really, we were on stand down at that time. We were on, I think, a 30 minute alert. <clears throat> we, at that time, we'd been on station in about uh, a little less than two months. We'd been uh, constantly asleep for two months. On, uh, we'd go from five minute alert to 30 minute alert. Uh, if they were expecting heavy weather or something like that, we could stand down to one hour alert. At that time, I think we were on 30 minute alert. We all watched the movie, and uh, at least I had gone to bed. I don't know what the crew were doing back there. But, uh, it's not a very nice way to be woken up, I can assure you that. Uh, we spent our time out there. Our primary mission naturally was SAR. We did a lot of secondary things. But uh, one of those things is like anybody else in the military, you always train for, and you hope it never has to happen, because in our situation up north anyway, you know, when somebody went down, not only are they in dire straits right then, but you were getting ready to be, because you are going in after them. Uh, anyway, this, when the SAR alarm, alarm went off, uh, I jumped out of my rack and went running. I can't remember if I went to combat or not to get a brief. I probably did not. See, I think we were off the deck in 10 minutes, so it didn't give me much time for a brief. I do remember running back to the uh, aircraft and uh, thinking, my God, is it ever dark out here? You know, it, it was. Uh, we were flying a single engine H2. Uh, grossly overweight, uh, not designed for the mission. Uh, taking off, even in the daytime, was uh, interesting because uh, we could not take off the full, uh, full fuel load. We had to have, as I recall, something like 15 knots of wind over the deck, and you lifted up into a hover, you slid off the side of the deck, and you dove with the water to gain uh, airspeed. And at night, this wasn't any fun at all. So taking off off a black ship and with no horizon, no visibility, and diving for the water when you're only starting out at 25 feet is not something you look forward to. So our first problem was get the aircraft in the air, hoping in 10 minutes that we'd get the thing started, all the tie downs off, hoping all the switches were still where you left them when you went to bed that night, and hoping nobody had been back there thinking around with anything. All the time you're taking off, you're thinking about uh, are all the tie downs off, are all the uh, you know, blade covers off. I hope the crew pre flighted this thing because I sure didn't have a chance to. That was what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Clyde. Uh, Leroy, uh, can you talk to us about what went through your mind when you got the launch order and then, then uh, step us through the, uh, what happened when you took that initial vector? direction that got you headed towards the beach, towards the SAR scene. Well, it's like that. We... Got to get closer? How does that work? Yeah. Like said, we dove for the water, and, and I think the different. We were at 12 feet, not 25 feet. Above the water. <laughs> <laughs> when you start off, you have to get down to, to 5 feet, because during the day, sometimes we have to leave the crewmen on the deck and go off and dump fuel and come back and pick up the crewmen, because that extra 100, but you wait, that was about 120 then. <laughs> <laughs> so we took off into the night, and uh, I had been back. I started the aircraft engines and everything until they held the rotor blades. Well, Clyde got the briefing out of combat, and I think, well, I don't I hope you got a briefing because I didn't get one. <laughs> but as we took off, one of the things that was required before they would send any search and rescue uh, inland or to pick anybody up was about three basic requirements, and that was that they had to be positive in contact with the pilots on the ground, they had to be successfully evading, and command call, who's 
nickname or whose call sign was Harbor Master was the senior officer out at the time, had to give you the okay based on all of the information that came in. So we flew off onto a vector straight out into the night. Things were pretty quiet. I mean, now, now that we got airborne, it was uh, pretty much routine. And we climbed up to altitude, and I forget exactly what it was, because 3,000, 5,000 was the norm. And we went in until there was a whole short point at about 12 miles off the beach because they couldn't shoot past the 12-mile mark at that point with their uh, shore batteries. And we went out there and we held for, I don't know, I think about 10 minutes until we got the okay to go in. Okay. Thanks, Leroy. Chief West, can you uh, give us a little bit of an idea about what sort of training you had to prepare you for this kind of mission? Uh, most of the training we went through, uh, talking about the search and rescue, uh, uh, being a SAR swimmer, uh, that was uh, pretty arduous and pretty rigorous at the time. Uh, being uh, checked out on uh, uh, different various weapons we uh, utilized on the aircraft, uh, the M60, uh, the M16, and the uh, 38s, and of course the 79 grenade launchers. Um, and that's what we used uh, during our mission in my Thanks, uh, Chief. Bruce, can you talk about any sort of uh, jungle survival training that, that you'd, you'd all uh, received prior to going on station? Uh, yes, we, we'd all gone to the uh, Sears School Search and Rescue. Uh, Is that on? You have to talk into it. Yeah, we had gone to a uh, survival school in Warner Springs. And actually, all it taught you was that you did it one hit and shot down. You didn't want to talk. And then a little in the Philippines uh, and the swimming school, like Don was talking about. And, and with uh, this particular detachment, I know uh, uh, Mr. Lassen uh, did a lot of flying on the Philippines just for us to practice with him. So we, we, uh, we did a lot more practicing. Thank you. Sir, good. Then training. Uh, they also had uh, 30 days in a long ago, also. <laughs> that trained them for about anything, I guess. There's a church in Philadelphia. There's <laughs> a church in Philadelphia. Uh, Zeke, can you, can you talk to us a little bit about the, the clock touched on a little bit about the post ejection sequence? and whether or not you were aware of the other person coming down the parachute and what, what you did after you hit the deck. You talked about hitting the uh, slimy uh, rice paddy and whatnot, but give us a little idea what it was, uh, what it was like, what you saw, how you were able to see the, uh, uh, any of the uh, surrounding villages and train and so on. Go ahead. Well, the first thing that went through my mind after uh, we got hit was that uh, we certainly had to go, and I, as Klaus said, uh, I was on the ICS about the time I started my ride, telling him that I was going to eject him. And I hit a big uh, ball of fire under my feet from the uh, initial charge of the uh, Martin Baker ejection seat. And, uh, and another secondary, when the second stage went off. I can remember, remember uh, blowing out of the airplane and doing a somersault uh, over the vertical stabilizer. And I thought to myself at that very time, uh, and I was the maintenance officer in the squadron, as you recall. I thought, damn it, this is our very best airplane. <laughs> <laughs> and it upset me. Uh, of course, there were a lot of other things that upset me at that point, too. But, uh, the chute uh, then opened. Uh, we had sky sails, sky sail chutes, so we were both uh, confident that we would uh, go a good deal distance from where our airplane augured in, and it did augur in, and I saw it. I, well, first of all, I saw the uh, missile hit the airplane and take most of the starboard wing off. And uh, then the things I just mentioned happened, and the chute opened. And uh, I began to uh, count my members and uh, see if I was still in one piece. I had uh, hurt myself slightly getting out of the airplane. I broke one leg, uh, then uh, strained my neck pretty badly, but at that point I was uh, delighted to be alive, so uh, it didn't bother me one bit. 
I uh, called for John called for me first. And said, uh, "Hey, see, can you hear me?" And I said, "Yes." And uh, was that on the PRC or was that just? No, this is uh, just air to air. We're just uh, yelling at one another. Mm -hmm. Not really yell. It's amazing how clearly you can hear uh, in the air. And our senses were very keen at that point. Uh, and if I might interject, I heard a little voice come back and said, "Shut up! They're going to hear us." <laughs> That was the next thing I said to John, as a matter of fact, because I could hear dogs barking below us, and I could hear a lot of uh, activity there, and I thought, uh, if I could hear John and he could hear me, surely those uh, dudes on the ground can hear us as well, so it might be wiser to uh, be quiet now for the rest of the way down. Uh, we landed uh, in a freshly dug dry bed, and immediately I realized I was up to my neck in uh, fresh dung. <laughs> or shit, or whatever. Uh, as a matter of fact, during that particular instance, I uh, just a pretty good shot of uh, Agent Orange, it turned out later. But uh, I heard John splash just before I did, and I got a clock going on him, so I knew about where he was. And of course, we intended to join as quickly as possible, and we think that did an awful lot to uh, enhance our chance. Okay, thanks, Eve. Call, let me ask you to kind of take it from there and tell us a little bit about uh, anything that uh, might have been unusual in terms of how you might have crossed bodies of water and, uh, and what your plan was uh, as, as you started to make your way from where you initially hit the ground. Let me pick up with, uh, I guess the first thing was that I really recall after hitting the ground was uh, that <coughs> Anytime you fly over hostile territory and uh, you're subject to being taken prisoner, before you go, you leave behind with the squadron people and people who are carrying on a potential rescue a list of uh, names and things which are only peculiar to you. Uh, what is your favorite ice cream? What's your wife's pet name? Uh, what, are, what color do you like? Uh, what's your dog's name? Uh, and those things are filed away moment comes to see if it's really you that's down there on the radio. And, and it's hard to believe that there could be somebody else down there that spoke English well, uh, but there were people there that spoke English well. There were people down there that had radios exactly like the ones we used because they captured all that equipment time and time again. And there was a good reason for having that positive identification. And one of the first things that we were asked to do was to identify, so make sure it was who was talking to the radio before they brought Clementine, two in across the beach. He said they were asked to hold until positive contact was made. So they commenced with the identification process and this arduous effort of what's your favorite ice cream, what's your favorite dessert, ice cream. And about the third thing they said, uh, of course I knew the answer was because I was answering from the things I had written down, and I realized that, uh, boy, this is wasting a lot of time. This is Claude Zeke down here. Get us the hell out of here. Claw and Zeke are fairly unique names. They were our crew names, our call signs, the abbreviation of the last name. And I remember A6 pilot relay goes to Harbor Master. I, I say again, it's Claw and Zeke, recommend commence the SAR. And at that point, uh, they dispensed with all the other tedious uh, coded words that we, had, that we alone knew that the enemy, of course, would not have known, and they did start the SAR. And uh, that was an awfully good feeling to save what few minutes it we had there to, to do that. Once we rendezvoused, we were essentially, uh, of course, <coughs> hampered by, by Zeke's uh, inability to run. Uh, I remember telling him, uh, you're not hurt. It's just a little ways ahead of you, John, actually. <laughs> <laughs> you're really not hurt. And it's, at that point, it's, it's amazing what adrenaline can do for you. You think of a, of a wounded deer or a wounded animal. Uh, we were a couple of guys that were really scared one of them was hurt pretty badly, and uh, that didn't slow him down at all. I mean, it's, it's, the mind overcomes it, the adrenaline kicks in, and uh, he was able to walk, crawl, stagger, run, do almost anything that uh, he needed to do. And so we started for the, the horizon, which uh, we could see there was a, a what we called a karst ridge, a limestone hill of sorts. We figured if we could get up there before the enemy troops really figured out where we were, we'd have a better chance because we weren't out in the open. 
and we're walking through rice paddies and we're making about as much noise as a herd of buffaloes and slosh, slosh. And uh, uh, Zeke did get ahead of me, and uh, all of a sudden I heard a big splash and uh, came up over a ridge, and there was an irrigation ditch. And Zeke was clambering up the other side of it. Literally had gone through this irrigation ditch and, and uh, took a nice cool uh, bath and hopefully got some of the manure off of me. But uh, in any case, uh, I, I was tempted to come along and I don't know why, but I sort of looked over to the right and here was a board laying across it and I walked across this board. <laughs> One of the first things, funny things happen to you in this situation. Zeke looked at me and he says, how'd you know that board was there? <laughs> and, you know, no, it just happened to look over there and I said, well, it's easy to walk across it. But, I mean, there are humorous things like that in the, in the most dire of circumstances that stuck in your mind because, you know, at that point, everything was uh, pretty poignant. And, uh, we had the feeling that uh, it's now or never. So we kept trucking and uh, finally got up into this uh, dense jungle. And again, I, I think Zeke summarized it this afternoon by saying the jungle so dense that you couldn't stick out your foot and take a step. You had to kick your foot. And finally, it got so dense that you couldn't kick your foot to take a step fell on her knees and started butting her way, uh, headbutt by headbutt, to beat her way through this jungle uh, up to a place, and perhaps that's why the Vietnamese couldn't get to us uh, and, and gave us some time for the helicopter to get in and the crew to get in position to, to start locating us and things of that nature. It was something that perhaps we had pre-decided before we went in that we weren't going to be sitting ducks, that we were going to do everything to our last day of, of trying to resist it do everything we could. Unfortunately, we'd been on a couple of prior SAR missions where the pilot on the ground said, uh, I'm not going to talk now, I'm going to hide for a few minutes and I'll be back up on the air, and he never came back up on the air. And by some stroke of fate, he taken that last step or, or said, come on in and shoot at him now, don't lose me, keep in contact with me, he might have gotten out, again, he may not have. But, uh, that had been our pre conceived decision to stick together, to do everything we could to, to hide, to, to get away, rather than uh, staying out in the open. So that's why we headed to the mountains, so to speak, and got into the jungle. Okay, Claude, thanks. Uh, Leroy got us to the point where we're Clem 2 is holding off the beach, uh, about ready to go feed dry. Clyde, can you, can you talk about the in-round portion to the area of the SAR and how you spotted the, the wreckage and where the uh, survivors might have been located. Well, we were told, told to hold maybe 10, 15 minutes off after uh, we got in the holding pattern, and we circled around for a while and talked to the cockpit about what we were going to do and so forth. The talking mostly consisted of, uh, they're not going to send us in tonight, they haven't done this before, or we won't be cleared in probably until tomorrow morning, and talked about a few things that were wrong with the plane. We we're having a few compass problems, uh, ADF problems, and our gyro was wandering off. So, and then Harbor Master came up and said, "You're cleared in." And uh, we said, "Boy, this is a hell of a way to get broken in." So, I told the crew to clear their guns. And we're going in, and we went. We came in. Uh, we had uh, guidance from rescue. It wasn't that much of a problem. I forgot what we went in at three, five thousand, three to five, five thousand feet somewhere along there. We were able to spot the uh, wreckage of the aircraft pretty easily because it was still uh, burning quite severely. And sometime along that point, I believe we established radio communications with them. We, uh, we couldn't see them. We would fly around, and the jungle was really dense. It, even in the daytime, if uh, flying a helo over a jungle in the daytime, trying to pick up somebody to see them below is extremely difficult. At night, the only thing we had was their strobe light, so we'd fly past them. We could hear them say, you just flew over us. You turn around and go back. Uh, Etc. Both of the crew and Leroy is trying to tell me which way to fly. And I, I don't know, we must have been in 10 or how long were in there before we actually were able to contact them. That we knew we had some money. How long were we over there? Only about 15, 20 minutes. Seemed like two hours to me. Anyway, we did establish radio contact and they were able to half guide us in. Uh, we asked at some point along the way, I can't remember when, asked for flares from uh, rest camp, which they started dropping in through the flares and uh, occasional strobe light. Uh, we were able to somewhat pinpoint position about halfway up the hill. Okay, Fred, may I just interject? I sure. think Clyde underplays the, and, and for 
from the audience to realize how significant it is. Uh, it was very, very dangerous in an F-4, and we rarely got under 500 knots flying over land, 450 to 500 knots at 6,000 feet. And there were still a lot of people shooting at us, and it was very dangerous. And to put it in perspective, here comes a helicopter. A young Lieutenant Junior Grade is a pilot, never been over land, never been fired on in anger, flying at what, 120 knots at that point? Almost stopped. <laughs> the point he was a sitting duck. I would have never in my wildest dreams undertaken to do that. And uh, to, to say that he said we ingressed and we did this and this so casually, uh, you really ought to appreciate the severity of what he did. It wasn't just a nice routine night flight over a desert or over a jungle. It was a, it's an incredible thing just to fly there and not to be hit. Uh, fortunately, it was pitch dark, as we've said. But uh, I thought that was awfully, awfully significant just to come in at that speed and, and to survive that kind of a thing, much less all the things that you'll hear that follow. Well, the flight ends. The flight end was really pretty tranquil. I mean, it was pretty quiet. We were just flying along straight and level because I remember we crossed over a ridge line and came up the valley, and we had the rescue, the combat air patrol rest cap above us, and we knew that they were going to shoot anything that, that came up after us. And I have to tell the audience that I, I saw a, a a report on the airplane coming down about how one's memory plays tricks on a person as they get older. My memory's gotten much better and much keener and much more specific as I got older, so I remember exactly what happened back then. <laughs> <laughs> but client refutes this to the day, but there was we were flying and with the doors closed, and they, like you said, the helicopter can only go about at 120 knots maximum. If we could have gone 500, we would have, but they didn't, they didn't make that possible. But I saw a trail of sparks, and I heard this huge whoosh go past the left-hand side of the aircraft. And my thought of that, well, they missed. So what the hell, we'll just keep going. And that was, uh, that was before we got into it. And then Bruce Dallas saw something later on. Uh, let me ask uh, Bruce, what did you see? I mean, uh, you guys are going very, very slowly. That was uh, tough enough, but you're also being shot at. And Leroy just talked about something that went past. Uh, did you and Don see anything, any AAA coming up at you as you motored into the uh, area of the SAR? Well, on our way in, no, I, and, I, and I recollect that we were about 5,000 foot, and, and, uh, and then when we got over the position where they had reported the, the, air, the aircraft, uh, then we started a tight spiral down, just spiraling down. And at that time, there was definitely a ball of flame that went underneath the helicopter. And I didn't say anything immediately, and I did look up to Leroy and say, did you see that? Yes. <laughs> That's not what he said, either. <laughs> the interesting what thing is, you ever played that either one? <laughs> I've been a civilian a long time. Did you see it, Don? <laughs> yeah, I saw a ball of flame coming up from the uh, port side, and I had mentioned that to the thought that uh, I thought there was something that was unrecognizable at the time come up and then shot off the uh, nose area. And, uh, I, I thought I felt like a little pitch a little bit, but uh, we found out later it was a sound. Sort of, you feel like they're kind of rude to do that. <laughs> yeah. Let me ask, uh, let me, let me uh, get back to the guys who are on the ground for just a second now and uh, ask Zeke to, to take us from the point that you're up in the course now, you're down on your hands and knees, you're butting your head through the, uh, the jungle. Um, did you come to a clearing at any stage after you got through the initial wall of the uh, jungle? Yeah, we finally did. Uh, if I recall correctly, Clyde, you folks made uh, five passes for us. Is that correct? Sounds good to me. I, I think <laughs> about that, you know, I, I think we landed down there three times and tried, uh, tried the penetrator twice. Once or twice. Yeah, I, think I only remember one time. But the first time, I know the penetrator went by twice because the first time uh, John and I were in really, really thick uh, undergrowth. And as he said, uh, we had determined that we could not walk through this stuff. We couldn't swing our uh, machetes because it was so dark. So we got down and just bucked this, uh, these vines uh, as you'd hit a football sling. And maybe you'd go 
10, 8 or 10 inches, then you'd do it again and again and again, and that's the way we were going through the jungle. <clears throat> and uh, we were pretty tired by this time, of course. And the first time uh, the penetrator went by, I could hear it but not see it. And the second time it went by, it was about four or five inches from my fingertips. <laughs> and I could see it coming a little ways before me through the jungle, and right straight by me, and then it was gone. And I thought, Man, that was really close. I sure hope we got another shot. <laughs> and we did, of course. But then shortly after that, we did come to a clearing. And uh, there was a very, very large bare tree there <clears throat> that we didn't like the looks of. But we stayed there because it was the only clearing we had come to. And uh, there's a lot to be said about that tree a little later on here. But uh, at that point, uh, they had a pretty good idea where we were. And what they had finally seen was they couldn't see our strobe lights down from up above looking in the canopy because it was so thick. But they asked for some 38 tracer rounds and they did see those. And I think uh, one of the gents from the Enterprise saw those and uh, tipped you folks off and uh, then we knew that uh, perhaps we were in business. But uh, the first two passes of the penetrator were not so, uh, were not successful at all, but uh, very encouraging you might say. And uh, then we were, Clyde was looking for a place to come pick us up, land and pick us up. All right, well, let's, let's talk about that, uh, if we can, for just a second. Clyde, if you describe for us that the effort of putting that penetrator down up alongside the, uh, the hill and, uh, and the encounter with the, the trees. The helo, like Leroy said, on a, on, on a good day it would hover uh, in ground effect, which is probably about 30 foot. We had a problem, we went in, we dumped fuel, I don't know how much we dumped, I think we dumped, uh, I don't think I returned the fuel dump off, Leroy finally turned it off and he said we're going to run out of fuel, to, to try to dump enough so we could go down and hover, and essentially we could not hover, it was probably lucky we, we did not, were not able to get them in the clearing, I don't, I really do not think we would have probably been able to pick both of them up in the aircraft and, and get out of there, because uh, on the one hover that, that we did make establish, which I thought we were going to be able to get them, I was, uh, I was maintaining a hover. Well, we started about 200 foot too high, so I kept uh, Dallas, I believe, had the sling all the way down. I won't talk about that, Dallas. But from my part of it, I started down, and I was drooping, which means you're losing turns. You're at maximum power, and, 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 and the rotor's just winding down. I was down uh, about 92% or something like that. You should, be, you should never go below 100%. So we were at absolute maximum power, and uh, just barely maintaining the hover at, at that point. And that was over there trying to lower it. Boy, the hoist. Go yeah. ahead, let's talk about the lowering the hoist. Right. Uh, at that time, I could see both the pilots. Uh, so I started lowering the hoist down. And we had maximum down, I believe, it was 150, may have been 150 foot cable. But we had it all the way out. And I could see that uh, they couldn't reach it. But we didn't have far to go, so I talked, told Clyde, and he started uh, lowering down into the trees. And at that time, we had light. Uh, we were still getting flares. But right when we got to where I thought we were going to get them, uh, all the flares went out. And here we were in the trees, and actually, we started hitting trees. And it uh, wasn't so much that you know, we had 150 foot of cable hanging below the helicopter and hitting trees, and then uh, trying to pull out, which we did. Uh, and then we just had to continue our circles again at that time and wait for uh, them to come down the hill. These flares that he mentioned are, are things that are dropped by airplanes in a parachute. And as the flare parachute comes down, then the flare ignites. They're phosphorus uh, flares, and they, they flutter down as the parachute comes toward Earth. Of course, the light gets brighter and brighter. What's right above that flare, or right underneath the flare initially, is that helicopter. So it's illuminated, as well as whatever else is underneath it. And uh, that's what he's saying, finally the light went out, and the flare hits the ground. Uh, the illumination goes away. At that point, he has absolutely no ground reference point. Uh, and he's in a hole just on his own instruments, and very easy to hit a tree or to have crashed or to have done any number of things. One of the many facets of things that worked exactly uh, to our advantage that night. Yeah. The uh, flare illumination is good for, what, JG? Is it 120 seconds? Three minutes flare illumination? I think it's good, but they don't last very long. Uh, Leroy, when you banged into the tree, what did 
to say to decline? Any commentary on the ice? <laughs> Would you please? Let's repeat them. Would you please get out of here? With expletives deleted, there's no comment. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> Don, somebody got... I'm sorry, go ahead. What happened at that point, I said, there, there was, I think, an old shit and, and that came across the uh, intercom system, at least on a couple of occasions, but the client was working frantically to, to pull us out of there because the we had gotten so low that we actually got the horizontal stabilizer caught and we did some damage to that and kind of pitched us in a turn and, and nose down and how we got out of there, I don't know. I, the whole evening, I, in retrospect, they had two large hands around that helicopter holding it around because as we flew around there, everything was quiet until we got to the first part. And then all of a sudden, everybody woke up at two o'clock in the morning with a helicopter around you and all these flares coming around and, and there's no alarm clock or anything down in the, in the Vietnamese hooches, but somebody woke up and sang the alarm because all of a sudden we started getting small arms fire back at us. Uh, and it was about this point, just to talk about the flight for a minute, as I said, it had been very quiet in the cockpit at that point, but two M60 machine guns, one of which was about eight inches away, the muzzle of which was eight inches away from Clyde's ear, right ear, that Bruce Ellis had, and I had an M16 uh, rifle up ago. Well, we got flashes from the ground, and so we everybody started shooting simultaneously, and it got really noisy, and the hot shell, empty shell casing, ejected out of my M16, hit the windscreen or the window, up there and bounced back got Clyde in the face and he was convinced that he was hit. I mean, all of a sudden, brrr, and, and things coming back flying in his face and, and he thought he was dead. And I, I said, oh my God, he's been hit, now I've got to fly. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you waved off, and I, I know that must have been an absolutely superb uh, bit of airmanship and you waved off and you banged in the tree, but somebody got hit in the side door. Bruce? Right, well, the tree. The, you know, I got knocked back in the helicopter from the tree. And then uh, when we straightened up, we were talking about the uh, muzzle flash. Not only was I, I guess, directly in front of us, we were picking up fire. And uh, the way we had this particular gun mount, mount, which was supposedly illegal at that time, but there's the only way you could actually use one, we, uh, I could aim it forward completely. And there's a little protective. Uh, <coughs> pull back armor plating by Clyde's head. Well, I, I guess I was a little excited and I and I, uh, I hit it once and then I got flapping. <laughs> with, so he's putting up with all this along with this <laughs> thing by his head. Was... <laughs> Go ahead, Clyde. It's not quite fair, really. One of the reasons, uh, well, there's a lot of reasons we didn't, we didn't get hit that night. One, we were, we were like uh, John was saying, it was our advantage. We're so damn slow they couldn't hit us. That, that's the way it boils down, because they were used to shooting something 500 knots, and that's what they were doing. They were shooting something 500 knots, and we were only going 100. So uh, everything they shot at, it seemed to me anyway, would go in front of the cockpit. So you'd have all these, these, uh, these tracers coming right, right in front of the cockpit, and you swear you are coming through the cockpit. And that's what happened. We had also uh, uh, safety officer nightmare, and CEO's nightmare, what, the way we did things out there. But we were close your ears, Lloyd. Thank you. Yeah, I told the commanding officer to close his ears. Okay. We were, you know, we were 3,000 miles away from home base, a couple of JGs, and uh, several E2s. What are you, E5s? Yeah. yeah. The, uh, senior enlisted man was an E5. And uh, we flew in short sleeve shirts. Uh, Actually, we, we flew in uh, marine fatigues. We rolled them up, except the crewmen, they kept cutting theirs off. I kept saying, you know, we go down in the jungle, you guys are going to regret that. And they said, well, we're not going to go down, we have to worry about it. And we never flew advisors down, and we never flew with gloves, because uh, we were told by several people, you got to ditch, your gloves get slimy, and you can't, you can't get out of the plane. So anyway, what they're talking about, you have all these flares going past the front of the cockpit, and you have my Leroy over there, puts his, puts his machine gun on automatic, and, and throws out 16 shots in two seconds, and, Dallas is over there shooting this M60, and I'm there with no gloves on. All these shells hit me in the face, and the first thing I do is actually slap my face. And I'm in a cold sweat, and my hands, and I reach my face like this, and I, there's nothing slimy. You can't do that. I said, I Leroy, I said, I'm hit. <laughs> and he, well, he just looked at me, he said, nah, you're okay. <laughs> 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 
Client, was it at this point that you, Let me, uh, let's go ahead, John. Was it at this point that you uh, gave your crew the little edict of uh, how serious this mission was? Yeah, well, I, I think that's a I very how serious it was. <laughs> would you carry them through that? That's a very important uh, point. I thought that this was well, a one-way trip unless they get, they're yeah. successful. Yeah. Well, they knew that before we went, we went in because uh, we predetermined that. But the mission was that uh, we would stay in. We got hit and went down, or we would pick them up and come out, or we would stay in until I had or we had just enough fuel to make it to the coast and we did to sea. And uh, so, you know, once we were in there, we were in there. The duration of coming out one, one way or the other. I mean, you come out with them or we get to see or go down with them one or the other. Right, and at that particular time, I, I had no uh, idea that we would go down, but I did think we'd be swimming that night. And, you know, <laughs> I, I knew that we were going to just wait that long, and that's what was going to happen. Fortunately, we didn't have to. See, can you, you saw all this happen in the... Uh, the ground perspective as they hit the tree, I, expect, I would expect. Um, when you saw them hit the tree and wave off, and kind of tell us what your plan was from that point and what your reaction was at the time. Well, the uh, uh, immediate plan was to get the hell away from the tree. <laughs> uh, I can, I don't know if, you, if your mind works like this, but mine works that when very, very important, vivid things happen to me, I can still see those things this day. Uh, they're in slow motion and it's frame by frame by frame by frame and uh, I can remember them exactly. Uh, as I went through school it didn't happen often enough but uh, it does happen to me occasionally. It happened to me when they hit the tree and I can still see them flying in the tree striking it. I thought the, the uh, helicopter was so upset that it would never recover. A uh, marvelous piece of airmanship. Absolutely uh, a spellbinder. Uh, and I thought to myself, uh, even in this situation, I can recognize uh, that, that quality of flying. And it was so uh, superb. <clears throat> so I recall that very vividly. And then Clyde uh, coaxed us down the hill. Uh, we were trying desperately to get down to this opening where he, that he had seen and where he was about to land. But we couldn't get there because we're in such tense jump. We went back out of this little clearing now, down the hill into another clearing. And uh, we luckily ran into a little creek bed. Now, by this time, we had a lot of company. And we could hear these people running around. They knew their way through the woods. We didn't. They were on paths, apparently, because they were, were moving. And we could hear them whoosh, go by on the side, whoosh, go by on that side, by in front of us. And they were all over the place. And uh, we were highly motivated at this point uh, to get down the hill quickly. And we hit this creek bed, and we got down. Uh, I got in at first and got a good start down. And John came in right behind me. Uh, that's why I, I passed the word to uh, Clyde that uh, we did have a lot of company and I thought if we didn't get us out in the next couple of minutes, uh, wasn't going to get us out. And uh, he said they were coming in. Uh, I took a strobe light, walked out in the middle of the rice paddy and uh, showed it. And uh, John was right behind me. Uh, kind of uh, as a rear guard there, watching up the hill. I saw uh, Vietnamese not too far behind John, I would guess maybe 20 feet. And here comes Clyde uh, and his marvelous crew. I heard uh, bullets uh, whiz by my ears, uh, splashing the dirt by my feet, and uh, we were ready to move. <laughs> uh, they came in and uh, uh, Coordination there was marvelous. They landed. Uh, I mentioned that we were in there at 9 o'clock. We'd run around in front of the helicopter, cross the bow, and in the starboard door. And at that point, and I was reminded of that today, uh, my leg suddenly uh, reminded me that it wasn't 100 percent. It fell down. And uh, I thought, damn, this is no time to falter now. <laughs> We'd already run several nine-second hundred dashes, so I thought it was time for another one. And uh, we luckily uh, got over the helicopter. Uh, Bruce Dallas uh, saw us coming, uh, saw me coming, uh, stopped his machine gun about two or three degrees before he would have had me right in his left shoulder, uh, reached over and threw me right straight across the helicopter, just reached over like this. Bam. I was in 
And about uh, 10 seconds later, Mr. Holesclaw made his entry uh, inverted uh, <laughs> in the same manner. <laughs> and, uh, and then we were out of there. Let me uh, go back for just a second. And uh, you talked about the helicopter, Zeke landing in the, down at the bottom of the hill. But uh, Clyde, how many times did you put the helo down? Uh, it wasn't just that one time, was there? I think we did it uh, three times, I recall. My, my memory is not explicit like Leroy Dean. My, my memory is good. It was three. You ask him. All right, Leroy, how many times did you land the halo or did Clyde land the halo? It was three. Three we, times. We made two approaches in at night and to back up. First off, they said we're on a karst. And I said, what the hell's a karst now? I don't know if you know what karst or not, but I didn't know what a karst was. And so they had to explain to me in English what a karst was. Somewhere along the line, the PRC, the Personal Radio Survival, whatever the C stands for, Somebody lost one, and among other my, my other talents, I do impressions. And let me tell you what was going on that was hampering the, both the intercom communication and ground. Here was this survival radio going off, pew, 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 constantly. And we, were, and we were trying to shut that thing off, and they were saying, come get us, come get us, you're right above us, come get us, come get us. And about that time, very coolly and suavely, I said, if you don't come down the hill, this is after about our second time, you're going to stay there all night. <laughs> I remember and that, that. that was, I think, the incentive to get down the creek and down the hill. <laughs> it's a very strong incentive. John, John, did you hear that? Did you hear that uh, the voice from above yes. giving you specific directions? I, it, that plus what uh, Zeke was talking about when we left the tree, I, I remember a small anecdote which, which was, was humorous. Uh, we both had in the pockets of our G-suit uh, two small pints of water, which we just routinely flew with. It had probably been in there for at least 30 days, and it was rancid, and it was, we didn't fill it up every day. It was just in the pockets of our G-suit, because we were going to go down, but if we did, we had some water. And all of a sudden, we had exerted ourselves, and we'd been on the ground an hour and a half, I guess, or an hour and 20 minutes, and we'd seen the helo hit the tree, and we knew we had to do some movement. I think it was Zeke said, let's take a drink. Because you know, at that point, you, you, you have to think about, well, I'm going to conserve this because I may be here three days. That's the only water we have. But then we got to thinking, well, I'm really thirsty. So we stopped and pulled the water out. And it was, just seemed like we talked, took the top off and it was, it was gone. And the whole pint, and we drank all of it. Well, we got to talking later on. And, and there are the theories that uh, you can take a sip here and a sip there or you can drink all of it and go for broke. And that's sort of what we did. Uh, rather than, than try to pace ourselves along the way, it, it gave us a burst of energy, a, a, a fresh adrenaline or whatever, but it, it really uh, was one of those things that if you ever find yourself in a situation that, where you <coughs> are thirsty, we'll go ahead and have a big drink instead of a little bit. Uh, it, uh, and, it, and it really did pay dividends, I think, in the long run. And, uh, of course, we didn't have to do it later on because we you know, drank fresh water off the do it. Uh, Leroy, what was the terrain like? What was the ground like when you were sitting there waiting for those guys to, to burst out of the jungle and race towards the helicopter? I don't know if it was the same rice paddy you went down in, but it, it was a rice paddy. It was all filled with water and soggy and everything, so you couldn't really land on the ground. You could only come into a controlled hover and kind of let the wheels rest in the water and the mud. And we had done that twice, sitting there waiting and waiting and looking at the, at the tree line hoping that they would come out and then people would start shooting and said, well, we can't sit here anymore. So we'd take off, we'd fly around a couple of times and then we came back and landed the second time. And again, the same thing, they, they couldn't get out of the jungle. And I think you were probably only 20 or 30 feet beyond the tree line at that, but just couldn't get to it up, up the hill. So it was slow to a little bit, but we were, we were uh, among the dikes. And then the third one, when we came down, and again, this, we had had another aircraft come back in to give us the rescue flares. Uh, and just on the approach coming down, they went out. And Hollywood over here turns on all the lights, the landing lights, the hover lights, and everything, and lit up like a... For Hollywood, he means uh, Commander West. Yeah. <laughs> Turn, put it up just like a cruise boat out there, uh, and lights all over. And I, I do remember the... You, with your broken leg, you beat John into the aircraft. You outran him. Out, 
all the way out of that jungle. So then the, we saw them, and Don, you were on my side, and why don't you pick it up when they were coming out of the jungle? I got two up here. That's crazy. Okay. <laughs> uh, as they were coming out toward, uh, from the jungle there, I, I noticed uh, there was some movement, and I had uh, called the, the commander Clyde there that uh, there was some movement, and it looked like they were coming out from the underbrush. Well, at that time, I was suppressing fire from the the six and a nine o'clock position. Of course, they come out about 9.30, 10 o'clock. Hopefully, I didn't hit them when I got for that. Huh? But uh, as, as they finally uh, came across and uh, they went to the nose section, I uh, basically sprayed the, uh, the whole area down. And from what I understand, uh, and I did see some uh, North Vietnamese uh, in that area. And according to the captains here, that, that's uh, exactly right. Okay, thanks. John. Clyde, can you step us through the, the departure from the area after you got the, the rescuees into the halo? Back up one second. I, I, I think it was the last time when uh, what Don was saying right there. But I remember sitting there on the ground waiting, and, uh, and Don came up and said, Hey, I can see him in a clearing. I'm going to go get him. And I said, No, you're not. You stay right here in the plane. About that time, I look out the right side, and here's uh, Bruce. He's already out of the plane. He's around in the front. I said, well, what the hell is he doing out there? I said, we can't leave everybody here. <laughs> so Don stayed there, firing his M60, and uh, Bruce, I think, he finally got back in the plane. Yeah, he saw him coming, so he jumped back in the plane. Yeah. At that time, uh, I didn't know who was on board or what we had, because the last time I saw this one was trying to go out the left side, and he was already out, and I, I couldn't see uh, you know, John and Zeke, so I didn't know where they were. And I... And all of a sudden I heard, let's get out of here, by either Don or Bruce, I'm not sure which one. And I said, are they on board? And he said, let's get out of here. It's the only thing you say. Well, I said, who's on board? And he said, we got them both. And it was a little more explicit on getting out of here because they're, they're both firing out both sides at the same time. And I said, well, one gun's going off this side, one gun's going off that side. We must have somebody on board, so we better leave. So anyway, we took off. I remember when we took off, there was, muzzle flashes coming right out behind where they had cleared the jungle. So there was somebody behind you, no more than about 12, 15, 20 feet, I would assume, to, to get there that quickly. But I remember when you came out of the jungle and Don said, I see movement coming out of here. Do you think it's them? And I said, watch them closely and if they start shooting, fire back. But if they don't, let them come in. <laughs> Bruce. So get us out of this rice paddy Bruce. Clyde. Bruce, <laughs> yeah. when, you, uh, when you finally convinced Clyde the other to get going, that you had, every, had everybody aboard, what did you, other than yelling at him at the ICS, did you do anything else to get his attention to tell him that it's time to uh, make haste? Go ahead. All right. I, I think the, the biggest problem there was he, he knew I had gotten out, and he didn't know, of course, he's sitting there uh, hovering the aircraft in, in that rice paddy. And uh, once I got everybody in, then I found that uh, some shroud line had, had uh, jammed my gun, so I'm, I was trying to clear it and hadn't had a chance to hook my intercom back up. So, uh, and we were getting fire from that side too, and so I thought it was probably most important that I started shooting back than, than worrying about anything. So I got un, un, that unjammed and then uh, gave him a tap on the shoulder to tell him that we needed to go. <laughs> you know, knocked my head off the tree. <laughs> So, you know, that's something that, you know, the surround lines keep your things from being lost. But um, as we were talking about, you know, one little thing like that could have been the end of it. You know, it, it just, so you never know. Uh, and uh, Leroy, now you're up on the way out of the rice paddy and you're uh, climbing out to uh, AAA on the way back to the beach on the way to Pete Wet. See any? Well, John was telling Clyde, now this is the fighter pilot telling the helicopter, you gotta start jinking. And we were telling him that we didn't have enough fuel to jink, we had to fly straight. And jinking means going back and forth so that you're not flying a straight line and, and making it an, an easy target. But it, it's climbing up, and now we're back up, and it's comfortable again. And I looked over at Clyde, and all of a sudden, it was a, like somebody had taken a, a handful of flaming darts or arrows and we're throwing at them. We were just crossing the coastline, and 
any pilot in the audience knows that anything on the horizon, it's level with you, and they looked like they were coming back at us. And I screamed at him, get down, and I hit the collective, and we'd lost about a thousand feet before Clyde got his heart pumping again, because that was the second time I scared the hell out of him up there, because I knew that those things were going to come at us. But yeah, there was a lot of, a lot of fires. In fact, uh, you saw some too. So did Tom. Tom, what did you see as you, as you came out? And about, what about the condition of the helicopter? Now, you've been damaged, right? You hit that tree, and uh, what was going on? Oh, we, we, hit, the, we hit the tree and we lost a, lost a door. And uh, on our way out, uh, I figured we were doing about 160, 170 miles or knots, but uh, I think we were doing, probably doing about 120. To me, we were, we were hauling, trying to get out of there. And uh, we had doors open, yeah, all the doors were open. <laughs> But uh, we were, uh, it appears to me like uh, during the 4th of July, uh, when you're up there and you're, you're looking at the fireworks out there, uh, at that altitude, you're above the fireworks, and that's exactly what it looked like to me. And uh, needless to say, I was, was kind of, I guess, scared. You know, yeah. <laughs> what was the fuel state at this point? You'd had a low fuel light on for yeah. a week. Yeah, we, had, uh, we were low on fuel. Uh, I think we landed about 135 pounds on board when we finally landed. Uh, but I mean, you were below 100. How many how many pounds did you have back then? 100 pounds? Two? I mean, you'd had the low fuel light on for a long, long time. I don't know. We had uh, we had several lights on. That was the least of my. <laughs> <laughs> at, at that point, the only thing I was hoping for we were going to get feet wet. Just praying for feet wet. Just, just get us to the coast. And uh, Leroy telling about scaring me. Uh, Actually, I think we came out about 150 knots. That, that plane was redlined at 120, 130. Like you said, with the doors on, I don't know what it was. But uh, I was flying it in and out of blade stall the whole way out, and uh, Leroy was smashed down on the collective trying to get us down to a lower altitude. And uh, my first thought was, you know, it's not quite that simple. We don't just, you know, dive when you're already 20 knots over maximum airspeed to start out with. So, uh, but we came back to the Jewett, and they, they gave us a vector in. The Jewett, by the way, I, I think at that time they were limited. They could not come in any closer than any of the ships could come in any closer than 25 to 35 miles because they could, they could be hit by uh, missiles from the shore. The Jewett must have came in to, I don't know, it must have been not more than five miles, maybe 10 miles away from us because they knew we were out of fuel. And they had heavy weather of some sort. So actually, as I recall, they backed down so we could land to get us the correct wind. And the only thing I remember is coming in and seeing the ship, and I remember uh, Leroy just reminded me tonight, I turned over to everybody and said, uh, okay, guys, let's just not screw up this landing. <laughs> <laughs> well, well now we're going to leave this uh, format for, for just a moment, and we're going to go to a question and answer session from the audience. So I'm sure that some of you out there might have something you might want to ask uh, the panelists. Any at all? Les. How far from the coast was that car stick? How far? Yeah, go ahead, Jake, if you got the answer. As I recall, we were 20 miles from the beach and uh, 119 miles north of the DMZ. We're in pretty good. Go ahead, Clyde. I remember we were just, when we picked them up, it was just south of the 19th parallel, because at that time there was a, uh, a, a bombing halt that our politicians had passed, that you could not bomb exactly north of the 19th parallel, which means everybody could bring their guns in at that time and get everything set up to nice. But uh, our compass was screwed up on the way out, that's one of the problems we had, and we ended up flying, I remember, north of the 19th parallel, and, and, and they ended up having to take us out north and out to the right by the time we were finally able to get the radio communications. I don't know where we started out, but I know we ended up coming out north. Okay. Flack. Did you see any bombs built going off from rescue? The question was, uh, did they see any uh, rescue combat air patrol aircraft that would be in position to provide cover or support for them, uh, other than flares, dropping bombs, firing missiles, anything like that? Go ahead, Clyde. I'll take it. Yes, they were there, and no, they were not utilized. And, and the reason why they couldn't see us, uh, what we were getting was 
actually from around an area which it would not have done any good to call them in. Number one, I wasn't sure where I was at any one time, and we weren't sure where they were at any one time, and, and there was nothing for them to concentrate on. And it was dark, and uh, we just I figured complicate things. So they were there and ready, and uh, but no, they were not called in to, for fire suppression. Admiral, at that point, I, there's something interesting, I think, in the, in the coordination between carriers. Uh, the way America, the USS America was functioning then, we were the, the noon to midnight carrier. And we went down at 12 minutes after midnight. And had we not gone down, we would have been required to be at, at uh, a position to commence an instrument night approach into the America at about 12.20 put all the planes to bed and go to sleep until the next, have your egg breakfast and go to bed and then get up and start flying again at noon the next day. The Enterprise was the midnight to noon carrier. And so as we phased out, she phased in and, and started her missions over North Vietnam. And as our A6 plane, who we'd been following, uh, approached his fuel uh, low point, he eventually went back to America and landed and was immediately relieved by a group of uh, Skyhawks that were based on the USS Enterprise. And they picked right up and, and zeroed in on our position and did whatever airborne coordination were available to drop bombs and they, and they were called in uh, to suppress uh, the ground troops who were, of course, searching for us. But it's amazing how those two big carriers would change their mission to save two guys down on the ground uh, and how they interlocked perfectly because from our perspective on the ground, we never knew that this had happened. Just one plane was there, then another plane was there, and it all was coordinated by Harbor Master, and uh, everything ran smoothly. Uh, even though it was two giant aircraft carriers working independently, uh, just like uh, you'd take the morning watch as babysitting, and, the, and your husband or so forth would take the afternoon watch, these two carriers were, were interworking and uh, covering our rescue. So, and we didn't find that out until some time later. And it was really a, heartwarming thing to know that uh, that system worked that well, and I'm sure it worked many other times uh, with the same effectiveness. Admiral. Any other questions? Fine. Sure. Sure. Any other questions? Yes. Fine. How, the question was, how long did the flight take uh, uh, after you picked up the survivors to get back to the Jude? And, uh, you guys weren't exactly quiet in the cockpit, I wouldn't expect you probably saying something. Well, the flight back, the 20 miles to get, or however far we were in, to get uh, feet wet took about three hours and 49 minutes. <laughs> to land on the ship after we got feet wet took about 30 seconds. <laughs> I don't know, it was a long flight. <laughs> it was a lot, lot longer than going in, I can tell you that, because uh, I really started getting antsy from the time we got them on board, because I, at, at, at that point in the venture, really, that was the only time and I thought that we really had a chance we were going to make it. And so I started getting a little antsy after that. But in reality, it was probably, you know, what, five, ten minutes, something like that. The sidelight about the trip back is I think John had the survival radio that was giving that. Now we had that pew, pew, pew going off right in our cockpit. And we told Dallas just to strip him and throw everything out the door because that radio was driving us bananas. It was just overriding. We couldn't hear the ship. We couldn't hear ICS or anything. So, you're lucky you came back with clothes on. <laughs> yeah, and I think uh, one of them kissed me in the ear. <laughs> on the way out. <laughs> no, <it's just> <laughs> <laughs> Bruce, was I, it? Bruce was I would it? hasten to uh, comment here that that's perfectly acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> Days, baby. <laughs> <laughs> that's wrong, Cap. <laughs> Any other questions? Right here. Yeah. Sir, uh, today's tech star technology includes uh, night vision goggles, dim uh, lights, IR reflective patches, DMV measuring equipment into the survivor off the PRC radio. Uh, do you think 
How we found them so easy? We had a lot of help. Uh, we had the rest cat primarily. They're the ones that found them. We didn't find them. Uh, you know, they told us where to go, and they guided us to the, the general vicinity where they were. Yeah, we had some very sophisticated equipment also. Uh, we had the seat of our pants primarily. That was, a, that was the biggest one. And we had a UHF ADF, which means when somebody was on guard, we could turn a button, and the needle was supposed to point at them. And that's primarily what we had. We know then when we pass them, at least, you know. And as far as all the other stuff, uh, if you couldn't see a strobe light through the jungle, I can't see how any of the other would have been any good. Not at that time. About the best would have been the DME off of the survival grid, because we'd known the distance to that way we could have talked it down. But as Clyde said, the rest cap flying overhead kept giving us vectors. Our aircraft, by the way, is a dark gray. It looked about this color. That's We came out of there without a scratch either personally or to the aircraft. I mean, we thought we were getting shot up, but it wasn't until we put the aircraft into regular scheduled maintenance that we found one bullet in the pylon, uh, on the tail pylon, and I always thought I'd get shot in the back going away from something, but that's what happened to us. So the dark night, the dark aircraft, there was a small light on top of the aircraft that the, the rescue above could, could see our position and give us guidance and tell us about how far above how far away we were from it. So, yeah, I'd love to have that night goggles. Of course, with all the parachute players, that that probably would have blinded us. Yeah. Questions? Yeah. <laughs> the question is, what about damage to the rotor blades? One thing I remember is uh, changing a couple bearings on the on the flap for the main rotor blades. And that was about it. We got some uh, pretty serious uh, vibrations that I felt, whether it was uh, pilot induced or <laughs> 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 it, was, it, it was there anyway. We had some vibrations. Other than that, uh, we came out of here. I think when I was ready. Okay. Question is, when did you lose the cargo door, Bruce? You know. Yeah, uh, actually we didn't lose the cargo door until uh, we had taken off with with the pilot's board. And uh, in fact, I just started to close it and it just went out of my hands. <laughs> and then I think maybe that's what damaged possibly the stabilizer in the back. And we had damage on some antennas underneath the trees. Uh, but uh, actually, as hard as I thought we hit the trees, it didn't do near the damage. Way in the back. Yes, ma'am. Uh, this is not a normal day at the office, even in the course of things in Vietnam. Back to the human side, how did you tell your spouses or your families that something extraordinary had happened to you then, before you came home? I'll we'll take that one at a time. And I'll tell you what, this is probably a good point to take from there. What happened uh, subsequent to your arrival on uh, Jewett? briefly, and then uh, how you got in touch with your family to let them know what had occurred and how you handled that part of it. See? The uh, <clears throat> arrival on the Jewett for me uh, was uh, about the fourth time that evening that the uh, thought flashed through my mind that uh, I had indeed died and gone to heaven <clears throat> because I was so glad to get there, but by this time my injuries had begun to uh, take hold over the adrenaline and uh, I'd broken some bones and uh, strained my neck and uh, had some sprains and other things. I couldn't move. Uh, I couldn't get out of the airplane. I, I tried a couple times and uh, in the process I reached over and touched Clyde on his shoulder. I didn't kiss him on the ear by the way. <laughs> and in fact I'd like to use this opportunity to uh, explain to you all that I am heterosexual. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
I said to Clyde, uh, I don't know uh, how I can say this, uh, Hoss, but uh, and he said <clears throat> very, very nonchalantly, you know, he said, we've been over here for a couple of months. We haven't had a damn thing to do. It was nice to have a little uh, something to do tonight. And I, that's no kidding. <laughs> I think it's important that we, and I, I think a lot of this debriefing tonight has been sort of off the cuff that way and, and informal. And I think that that was the style uh, that a lot of people use there. Uh, I've seen that same style in uh, Captain Logan, Captain Lynch, Admiral Lewis, and in many, many, many of you here in the room. And. Uh, it's really neat. But behind that style, there was an awful, awful lot of training, uh, concern, timing, teamwork. We worked destroyer sailors, second class, third class radar men. We're so expert that picked up our signal immediately. We're able to air control, the helo, right to the spot. And work not only carrier to carrier, but by example, by way of example, Harbor Master had been there for several months and he acted instantly, although a helicopter was coming up from down south to get us. And that's another comment Clyde made when I first got here, point I said, uh, uh, I think we were talking about something just for a second after we got feet wet. And I said, uh, now what the hell are you guys planning on doing there? Uh, you spent a lot of time in uh, you haven't got much gas left. And he said, well, he said, there's another helicopter on the way up. The force came to worse. We just thought we'd set her down and we think give you a hand until I got there. <laughs> That's pretty remarkable. <clears throat> there were a lot of people over there like that. I think we ought to remember that. Uh, How did you notify Jimmy and the family? I, I haven't forgotten the question. <laughs> So I bungee jumping, you've been doing it. <laughs> I told uh, Bob Lynch, who was my roommate at the time, that uh, if uh, I didn't intend to get captured, I, I thought it would be better to uh, uh, back up to a tree and fight as well as you could and uh, do that. But I couldn't do that when it came push to shove. <clears throat> you want to survive. Uh, so Bob was ready, I think, to, to tell people back uh, Oh, I think they had actually started the paperwork on it, that uh, we weren't coming out. Uh, uh, Jenny got a message that uh, we had been uh, shot down, as I remember, and I'm not sure that the message didn't cross somehow. But anyway, I got a, I got a class easy off as fast as I could and said, hey, I'm alive. Uh, I'm not uh, in perfect shape, but uh, I'm probably going to the hospital, and we very shortly thereafter made uh, arrangements to rendezvous in Hawaii, which was nifty, which is another whole point, too. My Navy career was a family affair. Uh, my wife and my kids were just as much in the service as I was. And while we didn't get supports from certain quarters uh, while we were fighting that war, we certainly had a hell of a lot from our families. Thanks, Steve. Bruce, what happened to you subsequent to the landing on the Jewett? Well, uh, of course, I was 22 and not married at that time, and uh, I, I think uh, they gave us a bottle of scotch. Not <laughs> 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 I, I laid out on the fan tail and drink it. <laughs> Clyde, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, they did lay back here and drink the bottle of scotch. <laughs> because I remember going back there and saying, hey, we're going to have to fly this thing over here tomorrow. But uh, the way my wife found out about it, I'm sure CTF-77 sent out a message, you know, uh, congratulating us, all of the crew, uh, what we've done. I went back to my home base at uh, AC-7. I think Lloyd Barthur, who's here right now, conveyed everyone there that had, you know, uh, girlfriends and wives, what we'd done, and we're all okay. Well, like Dallas, I was a bachelor, so I didn't have a wife and family. Did you get a bottle of scotch? 
They gave me this little thing, you know, just about a shot or so. I wouldn't much to it. Now, Zeke finished off. He told me today a whole quart by himself. <laughs> Not a fifth, but a quart. And I remember after we landed, we went through the debriefing, the war room, and everything, and they put us up, and because the Jew was not our home ship, the Preble was, that they put us in some place to sleep, and you're sitting there lying, staring at the ceiling at 4 o'clock in the morning, bright-eyed. We all found our way back to the aircraft, and, and about dusk, I mean, about dawn, as it was broken, and we started scouring that, looking for the bullet holes, and there wasn't one. But I remember I wasn't going to tell my mother because I knew she was worried, and it was already over by that time, and there's no reason, reason to worry. But I got a letter about a month later telling me that she'd been in a beauty parlor sitting, and somebody sitting next to it said, isn't your son's name? And here was an article that had made my home paper, and I didn't know that, so she let me know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm basically in the same boat with Dallas there. We, uh, when we landed aboard, they come out, and they congratulated us, and. Uh, and gave us a bottle of scotch. I think I swear it was a lot bigger than that. <laughs> but uh, remember, with uh, bringing with Dallas, and we were going down on a steel main on the side of the ship, and uh, looking at the stars, and we were pretty well wiped out. Uh, <laughs> not only tired, but wiped out, you know. Well, not to uh, further dramatize it. John Hostwell, by the way, has a file on everything. He brought with us his, with him uh, his, his file. I have just happened to have a copy of the message, which was the next to the Ken notification. And, uh, I can quickly paraphrase it. I think it was written by Luke Lynch back there. But, uh, it was the operations officer in our squadron. It's from USS America, the Secretary of the Navy. Information, new PERS, and, and a number of other people. Uh, it starts off uh, personnel casualty report. Fighter Squadron 33, and list my name, active duty, C, missing in action. D, 18 June 1968, 0015 in the morning, pilot of an F-4J on a strike mission over North Vietnam, aircraft believed hit by SAM, no shoots observed due to darkness. However, emergency radio signals heard for several minutes after the fireball observed. Electronic surveillance continuing, and then the addressee of your wife and uh, mother and father. Line of duty, <clears throat> what the relationship with your next of kin was. Uh, uh, my particular case was Caucasian pri uh, Protestant insurance policies in force. Some things which, uh, <laughs> as you read through this thing, uh, aren't very, aren't very uh, nice to read about uh, because you know it's it's almost like you're you're not here when you're reading them. And uh, of course, when this was written, there was no assurance that uh, we were here. And so uh, I thought it was a nice thing to. <laughs> well, it says on my agenda that Earl Rogers had carefully prepared for me that I'm to turn over the podium to uh, Clyde Lassen. But before I do, and before I ask you to join me in recognizing uh, this uh, great group of Americans that we have up here in the dais with me, I want to th personally thank Clyde Lassen for something. I thanked him for it earlier today and just wanted to do it privately, and then I said that I uh, wouldn't do it tonight, but Leroy says, why don't you do it tonight? He says, it's, uh, it's hard if I don't go ahead and do it, Leroy. So I want to thank Clyde for something. There's a, there's a cadet at the Air Force Academy right now who wouldn't be if it hadn't been for Clyde Lassen. Clyde Lassen rescued John Postclaw and Zeke Burns. Not Clyde, but Clyde and his crew. Uh, Zeke Burns, Flack, and a number of other people, after our war in Vietnam was over and we were coming home, came home on uh, something called the Magic Carpet. It was a system we had by, by which we got, got back and returned to the United States early, a number of air crew had fought the war for their period of time. The rest of us, bachelors, stayed on board the America, and we uh, completed a round-the-world crew, stopping in Sydney, Australia, and Wellington, New Zealand, and Rio de Janeiro, and then on home. On our first port visit in Sydney, Australia, the first night, John Holtzclaw introduced me to my wife. Had not Clyde, that's right, my wife, 
the beautiful lady who's now my wife. And I, Clyde done that and rescued these, uh, these two great men. Uh, that wouldn't have happened, and that cadet at the Air Force Academy would not be. So thank you, Clyde, very much for that. And I have been very greatly honored indeed to be part of this ceremony tonight, uh, to be uh, amongst these heroes who, as you heard tonight, aren't really heroic. They're just Americans. Join me in thanking them for one
to come get us if we were down on the ground, regardless of the circumstances. Clyde, I thank you, and I know that we'll always show this with a great deal of honor, not only representing you and your crew, but all of the great Clementines out there who are ready and able and willing to put everything on the line for their fellow aviators. Thank you. Well, there you have a rather remarkable story. I was talking with uh, astronaut Gene Cernan on the uh, phone this afternoon. Uh, he was aware that this was going to occur tonight. He said, I hope that you're going to videotape it because it's such a unique uh, experience that it needs to be recorded not only for the library and the museum here, but to be passed around uh, in the active duty service as well. And it is being recorded tonight and will be made available. Uh, I want you to know something else, uh, in case you didn't know. There were only four Medal of Honor uh, given to naval aviators in that long war in uh, Vietnam, and this was the first one. All of these people uh, up here have come tonight at their own expense. Fred Lewis came all the way from England uh, to be here with us tonight before he goes back to his command in Norfolk. Uh, some of the others uh, traveled us from as far away as Oregon, uh, flying, driving. Uh, so we certainly do appreciate you all being with us. I'd also like to call attention to the fact that this is another in one of uh, Earl Rogers' jewels, as I call them. Earl, won't you stand up? You're the guy that put this all together. I'd like to announce the, uh, the next event of this sort, which will occur uh, on Earl, the 16th, 17th, 16th of July, when we will have uh, Vice Admiral Dick Truly, uh, the former uh, uh, shuttle astronaut and uh, administrator of uh, NASA, will be here in our distinguished lecture program, where we will have a similar type of reception, and then Dick will speak to us on uh, the space program, uh, past, present, and future. Thank you all for being with us. Thank the families for coming. And uh, we hope you'll join us again for another evening like this. Thank you.